Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Fish Tank Guy podcast. Today is Tuesday, April 30th, 2019. We are on episode number 15. Holy smokes. And uh, the good news to report is I've done two podcasts in one month. Now, I didn't hit my bi-weekly thing, but uh, I believe between episode 13 and 14, there were roughly seven months of time that went by. So I'm pretty happy with it being like three or four weeks this time around. So thank you guys for sticking with the podcast. I've noticed that I'm getting a good number of uh, listens over there on Podbean. Right, and um, the YouTube uh, videos that I put up that are just the audio, they still get decent uh, listens as well. So I would like to thank all five of you for checking out the podcast and joining along with me in this journey of uh, life and uh, aquarium hobbying and fish keeping and all that good stuff. So uh, today we've got a fairly light episode. I'm going to keep it kind of short. I always say that and I always lie, but... um. Yeah, so uh, the reason I say it's kind of a light, lighter episode is that I didn't do a research topic this time around. I'm, I'm essentially going to replace my fish tank topic with a fish tank update and talk a little bit about maturing tanks. Um, but I didn't do any research this time around, so it's not going to be quite as in-depth. So for those of you fishy, fishy nerds out there, um, sorry that uh, I'm not delving into the message boards and, and getting everybody's opinion and feedback, but... Uh, I'd like to get your feedback and your opinions on some of the stuff I talk about today because it's new to me as well, um, You know, which is the whole idea of having a fish tank for years and how it can change and evolve and how you have to change and you have to uh, adapt to the different things that, that happen in your tank. So uh, first off, you know, start out with a life update. Uh, things are going pretty good. We had, uh, we had Easter earlier in April, which went, which went well. Um, we hid the kids Easter baskets in the basement on top of the refrigerator. We have a refrigerator in our basement and it took them a solid 15 minutes, 15, 20 minutes to find it. And they continually came upstairs and they were like, we can't, we can't find it. We're old. You guys, are you guys hiding it? And you're going to wait till we go into another room and then you're going to bring it out. And the whole time it was just sitting on the, on the fridge, which I think is, is like a testament to. Um, the uh, searching capabilities of a preteen and teenager. I kind of feel like I was the same way when I was young. One of those things like where uh, your mom says, hey, can you grab the peanut butter out of the refrigerator, right? And you open the refrigerator and you go, I don't see it. I can't, I can't see it anywhere, right? And it's like you have to move one thing and it's there, right? Or it's like on a side shelf and you're not really paying attention. So... Uh, I think that there was a little of that going on. I'm sure they walked into the room where the refrigerator was numerous times, um, but they never uh, managed to tilt their head up 45 degrees and see it on top of the, you know, fridge. But uh, so Easter was good. I always enjoy the post-Easter candy sale. Um, my favorite are the, uh, I don't even know the exact name of them. Uh, I think they're Cadbury and they're mini eggs, but so they don't have the Cadbury. They don't have like the cream in them. They're just chocolate, but they got that powdered like M and M shell on them, and they're so good, so good. I went to CVS. I got them fifty percent off, and I got a huge bag, and I ate them all within like a couple of days. They're freaking amazing. Um, but if you didn't get them, I hate to tell you, uh, you're not gonna be able to get them until next Easter. Uh, so. Uh, bummer town for you um other than that things have been going pretty good uh trying to get the pool open i'm not very good at you know treating the pool uh, it takes me a long time um maybe because it takes a long time to cycle and i'm just getting used to like the amount of chemicals that i need to put in the pool uh it's kind of a pain in the butt but i still have to put the filters in and i think those will help clear up the water a little bit but the interesting thing was uh last year i drained the pool a little bit too much and the sides of the pool kind of caved in a little bit uh because of water uh from the you know water from the ground seeped in behind the liner right and it looked like the pool was like caving in well over winter it like normalized you know it balanced itself out because the pool was like super full at one point because of all the rain and snow melting and everything and it looks like the sides are where they should be which is amazing because i did not want to have to buy a new liner that would have absolutely sucked so that's going good um 
I'm trying to think what else is going on. Uh, just, just a lot of different things. Um, my wife's trying to figure out what she's going to do for a new job. Like she's working right now, but she doesn't see her time uh, at this company lasting much longer. So she's looking for something new. Um, I'm applying to be a Chick-fil-A franchisee, which is more than likely not going to happen because they say it's harder to get a Chick-fil-A franchise than it is to get in Harvard. Um, but yeah, I'm going through the steps just to give it a, give it a good old go. And, um, because, uh, you know, what's interesting, I don't know this totally random is it I've, I've always kind of been interested, like, oh, it'd be really cool to run this kind of restaurant or, you know, it'd be really cool to have a Little Caesars or, you know, and what was interesting is that I started actually thinking about it. And when you look into franchising, the amount of money that you need to invest to start is huge. And we're talking like hundreds of thousands of dollars. And some of them, such as a Little Caesars, like the yearly payback you know, the yearly income that you that you basically put in your pocket is not really all that great, um, which is kind of surprising. But the interesting thing about Chick-fil-A is Chick-fil-A takes like a big chunk of your profits. OK, they take a big chunk of your profits. However, the cost to, you know, start up a Chick-fil-A franchise is very, very low because they build the building, they, you know, buy all the hardware, they basically do everything, right? You do have to pay a fee, but instead of hundreds of thousands of dollars, it's like $10,000. And the payback yearly is pretty good as long as your restaurant is successful. And I don't know about you guys, um, you, you guy, you girl, like two people listening. Um, I don't know about you two, but uh, here in Erie, the Chick-fil-A is f- a freaking madhouse. There's like always people there. You'll go there on like a Tuesday at 2.30 and there'll be a line around the building. You're like, do, do these people work? Like, why are their kids here? The school's not even out yet. It doesn't make any sense. It's like people take their kids out of school to go to Chick-fil-A. It's weird. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm going through that process. I'll keep you guys posted. I don't think really anything is going to come of it, but it's interesting to go through the the process and you know kind of see how they select people for their franchise franchises um all right let's so let's move on to the other things i'm going to do a brief gaming update uh i got movie reviews with oh man big movie in my movie reviews uh then the fish tank topic and then the fish of the week so in terms of gaming i've actually started to diversify my gaming a little bit um i don't play fortnite as much anymore and I essentially only will play Fortnite if I can play with one of my buddies. So I might have said that in the last podcast. So uh, Fortnite is multiplayer only. And I recently purchased uh, Sekiro or Sekiro. I don't really know how to say it, uh, how to pronounce it. And I think I might have talked about that on the last podcast too. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't really remember. Um, it's a From Software game. And it's been kicking my butt. I think I've got 25 hours into it. And a good number of those hours are just getting killed repeatedly by the bosses over and over and over again. But um, the game is really cool. It's really rewarding to finally beat the boss, um, whatever boss you're against. Oh, oh no. Oh, no. It's starting too early. The yawns are starting too early. Um, But Sekiro Shadows Die Twice... Uh, really cool. I would recommend it, but I would only recommend it if you uh, are up for a challenge and you are not easily discouraged. Because I think there were a couple bosses that I died to 15 to 20 times easy before I ended up killing them. So uh, highly recommended, but just be a little weary. Um, and the other thing, the other game I started playing is Golf Story on the Nintendo Switch. It is a golf related rpg type game um so one ha- one aspect of the game is is walking around talking to npcs um doing like little quests and things like that gaining experience leveling up your abilities um getting new equipment like golfing equipment and stuff like that and then the other half is like an actual like golfing game similar to like mario golf where you have the meter in the bottom and you can do power shots and different things like that and um it's actually really good it was it was a really good deal i think i got it on sale for maybe like five bucks um i'm not a huge golf fan i I used to play golf years ago until i realized i was absolutely terrible and then um 
you know, I stopped playing golf because it's like, well, I can pay thirty dollars to uh, go on the golf course and be miserable because I'm so upset that all my shots are absolute trash. Uh, or I could just save that money and um, do something I enjoy with my time. So and I don't play golf anymore, but I like the game. So if you have any interest in golf or you're even okay with golf, uh, it's definitely a good game to check out and pick up. Um, so I would recommend that one too. So those are the two new games I'm playing. I still do Fortnite on the side. I'm hoping to finish Sekiro uh, soon, within the next couple weeks. And then, oh, man. Guys, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, and then uh, I've got a bunch of games in the backlog that I'll attempt to, to knock out at some point too. So, um, yeah, gaming's going, gaming's going really well lately. I'm, I'm enjoying the diversity, uh, getting stuck in one thing like the Fortnite mode is just, uh, loses its luster very quickly. Uh, so I'm happy to be, you know, doing some different things in the gaming space. All right, so now on to my five movie reviews in five minutes or less. It's not going to be five minutes or less because of some of the movies in this list. Um, I'm going to go through. I'm going to let you know what my grade is. I'm going to try not to spoil much. Uh, I'm going to, yeah, you guys know the drill. Okay. Uh, First movie is called Ben is Back, Julia Roberts movie. She has a son who basically has been in and out of rehab for many years, I'm pretty sure, uh, addicted to substances drugs different things like that Uh, he comes out of rehab comes home says hey i'm a changed person and uh, is he a changed person yes but because of how many times he's gone through this cycle of saying he's changed and he's not really his family doesn't really fully trust that he's actually changed uh so it was a really interesting drama type film um I thought it was. I thought it could. It was fairly realistic. Uh, yeah, I've never, you know, had a family member who uh, got caught up in substance abuse, but I think it would be. It seemed kind of true to life to how some people might handle it. Uh, I thought it was pretty good. Um, it wasn't as great as I was expecting to be. Expecting it to be, and I think the story kind of. I, I wasn't really sure where they were going with it, and it wasn't like I, I don't know. I can't really can't really put it into words. It wasn't like a complete story to me. You know what I mean? It was kind of like one of those stories that was just like about life and there wasn't like a, a like a like a, a plot point that they were necessarily following throughout the whole thing and there's a resolution and you feel you know some sense of uh 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 what's the word? Um I don't know reward reward it? I don't know what I'm saying. Anyway, the movie gets a B. I need to move on. I'm struggling here. Movie gets a B. Um Next movie, really old movie, Arachnophobia from 1990. Um, 29 years old now. Holy smokes. Uh, We watched that with the kids uh, like a week or two ago. It was a Halloween movie that we were supposed to watch during Halloween, but we never got around to it. And uh, I think they really enjoyed it. I thought it was pretty good. If you do not like spiders, you will probably be freaked out by the movie, which is the point of a horror movie. So you should definitely go see it. Um if you're not freaked out by spiders, it's still pretty creepy. There are still parts that are really creepy. Um, and I gave it a B. I thought it was a pretty good movie. Not amazing. Um, but, you know, it would be something I would consider watching again, especially around Halloween time or when you're in the mood for something scary. And it was a pretty decent, like, family movie, too. Not too many swears in it and things like that. All right. Uh, next movie was... I'm leaving the two the biggest movies for me last. Uh, the next movie was The Upside. That stars uh, Kevin Hart and Brian Cranston. Um, it's essentially about uh, Brian Cranston is a quadriplegic, so he only has the you can only you, you only move from his neck up. And he was once a rich, well, he still is a rich multimillionaire. And he was in it seemed like a horrible accident related to like. Uh, like wind sailing or yeah, I don't know what it's called parach- paragliding maybe it's not parachuting paragliding maybe uh, he's in a horrible accident really left him jaded Kevin Hart is an ex-con he goes into the job interview not knowing what it is Brian Cranston sees something in him sees something interesting like more interesting compared to the other people who are applying for the job who are very like straight laced very professional kevin hart is very unprofessional and he's kind of like the worst person for the job and kevin hart picks him and it was a really good movie it was based on an older movie called the untouchables i believe which i never saw so i can't speak to how it is compared to that 
but I thought on its own, it was a really good movie. It was a really heartfelt movie, good message, uh, just a feel good movie. I gave it an A. I really liked it. I didn't expect to like it that much. And it, it, there were a lot of funny moments in it too, which was really cool. Okay. So now down to the two big ones. The first one, uh, is glass. Uh, I didn't talk about glass, but I saw glass when it came to the theater back in January Glass was the culmination of Unbreakable and Split in the M. Night Shyamalan or Shyamalan uh, movie universe. This was supposed to be the conclusion, like a trilogy almost, of Unbreakable and Split. Okay. I was looking forward to this movie so much. So my expectations were very high. So that could factor into my opinion on it. I'm not sure. I don't really think so, though. Um Unbreakable is an amazing movie. If you have not seen Unbreakable, you need to go see it. Split was also a very good movie. Uh, If you haven't seen Split, you need to go see Split. You should see it Unbreakable, then Split, then Glass. And the thing you have to realize is that Split came out like 15 years after Unbreakable. And they are tied together in some sort of way, which I won't say. Uh, So when I finally saw Split and I saw it was tied to Unbreakable, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so crazy because I loved Unbreakable. It's a great movie. Different movie, but really good. Now Glass came out, and like I said, I don't really want to give anything away, so it's hard for me to really talk about it. But unfortunately, I was really disappointed by it. I thought the movie was well made for the most part, but I don't think M. Night made great decisions when it came to his characters how he treated them, and how their stories concluded. I'll put it that way. Um, I just, uh, I think he was trying to go for something different, which he definitely did, and I don't think it worked. It didn't work for me. Um, The way that he ended the film, um, you know, there are other films that end in a similar way, but how they treat the characters matters with how you feel walking out of the movie theater, And I just felt like bummed out and I don't go to the movies to feel bummed out. Right. I mean, there are movies that are sad that tug on the heartstrings and whatnot, but for that kind of movie, what it could have been and what it ended up being super bummed out. I gave it a C plus. I will probably watch it again at some point, but going from unbreakable, which I thought was amazing. I've watched multiple times. Same with split. I've recommended them both to people. Uh, And then going to this, it was just like, ah, gosh dang it. Disappointed, okay? I don't know, last but certainly not least, and I know I'm already over my five minutes, so I'm going to try to do this fast, Avengers Endgame. Uh, If you haven't heard about this movie, you probably don't live um, anywhere with technology, so you're probably not listening to this podcast. Um, But Avengers Endgame, obviously the final movie, kind of, I mean, the the universe is going to continue, but the final movie in this section of the Marvel universe. And all I can say is, uh, it was uh, amazing. It was great. Uh, there were 21 movies, I believe before this movie came out and to make a final movie that kind of does callbacks to those movies and has like Easter eggs and fan service and things you would have never thought you'd see and ended pretty good right um it it was just great it's really easy i i think for these big budget high expectation movies to really fall flat and it definitely did not uh that being said there were some things about the movie that i didn't really get i think there were some plot holes um there were a couple parts that made me a little sad but again i thought the way that they handled the characters uh, was great. They handled them all with like respect for the characters and, and respect for the pa- fact that people have followed these movies for 10 years now. And the, they kind of realized that people would be disappointed if their characters were treated poorly, even if they didn't make it, right? Not everybody lives in the movie, obviously. Um, but uh, I really, I loved it. And my stepson loved it. And uh, we had a good time going to see it. I gave it an A. Uh, Check it out. Definitely awesome. See Infinity War first and then go to Endgame. And uh, just enjoy yourself, right? Try not to get too wrapped up in some of the plot points because it is a little bit confusing at times. Um, If you suspend your disbelief, you'll, you'll pretty much enjoy it throughout, I'm pretty sure. 
Okay, so there are my five movie reviews. Sorry it took so long, but I appreciate you guys sticking with me here. Um, all right, so next I'm going to talk about um, my fish tank topic of the week, which is essentially just going to be an update on my fish tanks, and then I'm going to you know, uh, rant a little bit, complain a, bit, a little bit about what's been going on. But uh, first I'm going to talk about the fish tank tower. The fish tank tower is doing pretty good. I haven't really added in anything to it in quite some time. I do have some Aptasia forming in the middle tank, which is kind of a bummer, but I will do what I can. No, it's forming in the lower tank, actually, and in the middle tank. It's forming in both, so I'm going to get some peppermint shrimp to help kind of keep that at bay, but um, so I'm kind of bummed out about that a little bit, but the fish tank tower is doing pretty good. Uh, the struggle that I have with it is I don't have the time to keep up with the maintenance and doing water changes, so it's slowly kind of going downhill. Um, it's just, you know, this point, this time period of my life here, you know, my kids are involved with a lot of things, saxophone lessons, baseball games, baseball practices, baseball practices is, amount to basically two to two and a half hours after you drive there, you have the practice and you drive home and you're doing that multiple times a week. And uh, all of a sudden your free time is very limited, right? So um, I'm struggling to keep up with the fish tank tower, but I'm doing my best. It still looks pretty good. All the fish are doing good. Nobody's died or anything like that, but it could use a little work, which I'm planning on doing tonight, actually. I, am, I know I'm going to have some free time tonight, so I'm going to work on fish tanks most of my night. Uh, the other tank is the Pico Reef. The Pico Reef is also a struggle um, because as many of you know who have been in the hobby for a, a while, smaller tanks are harder to keep care of or take care of. Uh, the reason that I struggle with the Pico Reef so much is that the algae tends to build up very quickly. The water tends to get dirty very quickly, and that's partially because of the sun coral. Sun coral requires a lot of feeding, and obviously I'm not able to shoot. Oh, shoot, I'm getting cold. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, I'm obviously not able to get 100% of the food in the in like the polyps, so it's floating around in the water and it breaks down, and that's what causes the water to basically get dirty. You know, there's buildup, and you have a lot of algae and things like that. So um, that tank needs a good cleaning as well. And um, yeah, that I mean that just that that tank is a prime example of why a sun coral is very difficult to keep. I'm gonna do a video on a sun coral soon so you guys can kind of see what it looks like now uh, it looks pretty good but the headache that I go through to sort of keep it like that is uh, I don't know if it's worth it right I mean it's a cost benefit analysis I don't know if it, it comes out as a benefit well we'll see uh, so anyway the the main tank that I want to talk about is the biocube uh, biocube same as the other tanks kind of struggling to keep up with it uh, I sort of do my best. I try. I try to do water changes. I haven't done one in a while. I need to do one. Plan on doing one tonight. Um, but the issue with the BioCube now is what I'm starting to see with having a mature tank. And what I'm talking about, and something you never really anticipate when you're starting your fish tank, is my tank is basically starting to outgrow itself. So I don't have nuisance coral in the tank, right? I don't have GSP. I don't have pulsing zinnia. I don't have um, I don't have a lot of coral in that tank that grows rapidly and sort of takes everything over. However, I do have the cabbage leathers, and the cabbage leathers have taken up a solid third of the tank at this point. The entire left side is cabbage leather. The entire top is cabbage leather. It's actually grown over top of the Incredible Hulk SPS um, coral. And obviously, the part of that coral that's underneath the cabbage leather is bleached out because it doesn't get any light. Uh, some of the corals lower in the tank, they're not getting as much light because they're getting bleached out. And now the issue I have is that I need to take this cabbage leather out of, out of the tank, and I need to take a lot of it out. Um, and this is a whole other aspect of reef keeping that I never really considered or thought about, and it's a pain. Like, it's kind of a pain in the butt, right? Uh, unless you have a lot of time, you know, and you're easy, easily, easily able to manipulate what's in your tank, you have a good setup in the area. Uh, it's kind of, it's kind of challenging, right? For the cabbage leather, you know, my options are, you know, either cut it off while it's in the tank, which I'm probably gonna end up doing, or you take the rock out and you move it to another location, and then then you work on it, maybe outside of the tank or in a bucket or something like that. But even then. 
that's difficult as well because you have other corals attached to the rock. You don't want it to be exposed to the air. You, um, you know what I mean? Uh, so this is something that I haven't really thought about too much. I would love your guys' opinions if you listen to the podcast this far. If you have a mature tank, you know, kind of tell me what you've learned about how to maintain it and how to keep it and um, you know, what you do to keep up with it. Uh, but it, it does seem like corals can take over. And I'm looking forward to getting it out of the tank. I think I will be able to sell it, some of it, or at least get like credit at a local fish store for some of it because it's all in good shape. There are plenty of pieces for someone to frag off. Maybe I can even just sell them myself. Um, but yeah, it's it's really kind of rough. It's really kind of rough. Um, the tank is getting harder and harder to, to, to keep up with because the coral is spreading so much. Um, it, it, you know, it's extended off the rock close to the glass. It makes the glass difficult to clean. Uh, it makes it difficult to get to the sand bed in some spots, different things like that stuff you would never really consider. And the other thing is that coral really roots itself. You know, it's not like I can just sort of peel it away and it just kind of, you know, oh, oh, I'll just peel it away. Right. And, uh, then I take it out of the tank and it's all good. Right. Like it, it really requires like a lot of effort to essentially rip it out of the tank right and you can try to cut it as well if you want um you know depending on the type of coral some you need to be more sensitive with the cabbage leather is like super hardy so you can just pull it out and well again can't just pull it out you can rip it out and you can move it into another tank and it'll come back better than ever it'll be fine right but it's just something for you to consider if you are starting a reef tank or you've had one for a year or two years, you know, take a look at your tank, see what's going on, what's growing, and try to envision where it could go. Um, I think that's why a lot of people like to avoid nuisance coral because eventually it overwhelms the tank and it's not easy to get rid of. So just another aspect of uh, the reef hobby that can be challenging Um and yeah, that's all I really have to, to say about it. I haven't done much research. Maybe I'll do a future fish tank topic of the week and I'll do some research on maturing tanks. But I just want to talk to you guys a little bit about my tanks and kind of what's going on and give you something to anticipate or expect when you know starting a tank of your own. Okay, so how far are we in here? We're 27 minutes in. Man, I might hit half an hour. Uh, the fish tank, uh, brr, fish of the week, the fish tank guy, Fish of the week is the firefish. Fairly, fairly, you know, common fish. However, I got two of them for the lower tank and the fish tank tower. I really like them. Uh, they have good personalities. They're a little skittish, a little scared, but um, they look great. I got a purple one and I have a red one, so it's really cool. I got a combination of both colors, and I think they make for a great, you know, beginner fish. So I'm going to take you through the live aquarium description. We're going to see, oh, there are a bunch of testimonials. And uh, then we're going to wrap this up. Okay, episode 15, wrap it up. All right, firefish. Quick stats, care level easy, temperament peaceful, obviously. Color form, orange, red, white, yellow, also purple. Uh, diet carnivore, reef compatible, yes. Uh, max size, three inches. Minimum tank size, 20 gallons. Disagree with that. You could easily put a, two of them in a, tw- in a 10-gallon tank. Um All right, let's do the overview. The firefish is one of the more popular fish in the marine hobby. It is a magnificent fish with brilliant coloration, a unique body shape, and unparalleled personality. Also known as the firefish goby, fire goby, and magnificent or fire dartfish, what the frick? I didn't know all this. Has a yellow head, white anterior, and pinkish to orange red posterior. The dorsal, anal, caudal fins are highlighted in black. In addition to the striking coloration, the firefish goby is also heralded as a sweet-tempered fish with lots of personality. And because of its small size, the firefish goby makes a great addition to the smaller reef system. Uh, In the wild, don't care. To best recreate their wild habitat, the firefish goby requires a 20-gallon, 10-gallon, or larger system with moderate lighting conditions and a moderate current passing over the live rock reef. Keep in mind that a stressed firefish goby will try to jump out of your aquarium. As such, how's the firefish goby in in aquarium systems with a lid? Hobbyists who use a halide system with an open top should construct a plexiglass edge around the trim at least 10 inches tall. 
Along with algae and zooplankton growing in the aquarium, the diet of the firefish goby should consist of finely chopped small crustaceans, vitamin-enriched brine, fish, live or frozen, mites of shrimp, and prepared food. All right. Customer testimonials, Dave P. from Tookwilla, Washington, says, Probably the best deal for wild coloration, price, and a unique body shape in any saltwater. It is probably also the most docile saltwater fish, too. They swim medium to high up in the tank, but need their hiding space when startled. They are jumpers, so don't have a large opening on your tank lid. Um, let's see. Ryan L. from Columbus, Ohio says, I bought a firefish goby in February, and since then he has done very well. Um, he has fed spirulina, I don't know what that is, daily, and brine shrimp three times a week. He has added a lot of character to the tank and is always out looking around, acting as a lookout. It would be a good addition to any tank. Uh, Cole A. says, from Toluca, This fish is a survivor! We had two in our 30-gallon nano reef and had a massive ick outbreak that killed everything except these two fish. Oh, that's good to know. So they're pretty hardy. Um, Harvey from West Virginia said, He is doing well in my 20-gallon. Feeding takes forever unless it's just my patience. Spelled P-A-T-P-A-I-T-I-E-N. T S, so he attempted to spell um, patience, but like uh, patience. Uh, if you're a doctor and you have patience, not like patience that you're patient. I don't know. Um, oh my gosh, there's so many of them. Let's let's do my corner of the woods. Kim P from Pittsburgh, PA. Kim P from Pittsburgh, PA. He was always hiding and went to the bottom of the tank order, but he was fun to have in a tank. Unfor- oh, oh. Mm. Unfortunately, ours died because he was too scared of the other fish to come out and eat. Yeah, he is kind of a wuss. I will give him that. Chris C. from West Nottingham, New Hampshire says, I ordered three of these from Live Aquaria and they came active, alive, and healthy. I have three that school around the aquaria most of the time. Very nice, inexpensive fish. All right, one more from Alden L. from Oregon. Firefish are great fish overall, but need extremely peaceful tank mates to thrive. I kind of agree. They are best kept in a pair in a nano reef tank. Amazing colors! Bunch of exclamation marks. So there you go, everybody. There's the fish tank uh, guy, fish of the week, the firefish. Go check them out. Uh, they're relatively inexpensive in between 10 and 15 bucks. You should be able to get one medium size and, uh, they make great additions to your tank as long as you don't have any aggressive folks in there with them. So, um, yeah, that's it for the fish tank guy podcast this week. Thank you guys for hanging out with me. I didn't make 30 minutes cause I never make 30 minutes. I'm a pathological liar when it comes to the time of the fish tank, uh, guy podcast. I'm uh, pretty honest about everything else actually, but, uh, when it comes to the fish tank guy podcast, the 30 minute thing is a lie. And it'll probably always be a lie. Cause I talk way more than I like to admit. So, uh, thank you guys for sticking with me through 15 episodes or sticking with me through five or one or half an episode or three minutes. However long you've listened. I really appreciate it. Uh, continue to follow me on YouTube. Check out the podcast on any podcasting services, man. I got a sneeze coming on. I'm trying to get through this here. And, uh, <clears throat> Yeah, that's all I got. Hope you guys have a great week. Hope everything's going well for you. Hope you're enjoying spring wherever you're at and you're getting all excited for summer. Oh, yeah. Uh, All right. I'm the Fish Tank Guy. I will see you guys soon and uh, take it easy. Have a good one.